Hello, welcome. I'm Paul Cowling with Film Independent and welcome to the 2020 Film Independent Forum or virtual forum this year. Uh, you are tuned in to the case study of Swallow. I'm very pleased to be joined by the team behind this film today. So uh, joining us is writer, director, Carlo Mirabella Davis. Carlo, hello, welcome. Hello, how are you? How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having us here, Paul. It's oh, a pleasure. Are you in New York? Yeah, I'm in New York. Um, yeah, how about you? Well, I'm in LA, although I don't sound like it, but yes, I'm in <laughs> LA. <laughs> and uh, we're joined by two of your producers, uh, our good friends, Molly Asher and Minette Louie. So here's Molly and Minette. They are both winners of the Film Independent Spirit Awards Producer Award, not the same year. Uh, Molly, you won this year, right? And Minette a few years ago, 2013, is that right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Welcome both. Are you both in New York? Yes. Yep. We are a well, New York crew. Thank, you. thank mm -hmm. you for joining us today. Um, so we're going to take viewers through the sort of journey of bringing Swallow to the screen. So I want to start uh, at the very beginning. Firstly, um, we're not going to cut to the trailer here, but we'll let people, when they're watching this, have the trailer at hand. But uh, um, Carla, why don't you just briefly tell viewers what the film's about? Right, so uh, Swallow is a um, psychological horror film about a woman in an unhappy marriage who uh, develops um, a compulsion um, called pica, which is the um, urge to consume um, inedible, uh, dangerous objects. And she um, must elude her husband's controlling family in order to discover the uh, secret behind her obsession. This is a real condition, right, pica? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, and uh, the film was inspired by my grandmother, who was a homemaker in the 1950s, also in an unhappy marriage, um, who actually developed um, various rituals of control. Uh, she was an obsessive hand washer who would go through four bars of soap a day and 12 bottles of rubbing alcohol a week. And I think she was looking for order uh, in a life she felt increasingly powerless in. And my grandfather, at the behest of the doctors, put her into a mental institution where she was given electroshock therapy and insulin shock therapy and a non-consensual lobotomy. Um, and I always felt that there was something punitive about how she was treated, that she was being punished in a way for not living up to society's expectations of what they felt a wife or a mother should be and for being different. And I always wanted to make a film about that. But um, hand washing is not very cinematic, or maybe it's becoming more cinematic now that we're all <laughs> obsessively doing it. Um, but I remember seeing a photograph of all the contents of someone's stomach with pica that had been surgically removed and fanned out on a table like an archaeological dig. And, uh, and I was fascinated. I wanted to know what drew the patient to those artifacts. It almost seemed like something mystical, like um, Holy Communion or something. And I wanted to know more. So that's how it began. Okay. So when did you, when was the first draft written? I, I wrote the first draft I, I, uh, in, in like a month, actually. But it took years of writing and rewriting uh, to get to the final version. But um, I'm trying to calculate. Uh, I think it was about a year before um, um, I began, you know, looking around, chopping it around. Um, so that must have been 2017, maybe. Okay. All right. So um, then Molly and Minette, how did you join the project? Um, well, uh, uh, Carlo and I both went to NYU grad film and he asked um, uh, one, of the, one, of, one of the students or, or alumni there uh, for a recommendation of a uh, producer. And um, we had a mutual friend and she recommended me and, um, and Carlos sent me his, his um, the script and his thesis film from NYU. And, um, and when I watched the thesis film, I knew right away that I wanted to work with him even before reading the script because there was just something very um, tactile and special about, about the way that he saw the world and depicted this world. And then I read, and then when I read the script, I, I really fell in love with the story and, and felt like it was something specific to, to Carlo's voice that he should really be the one to tell it. Minette? 
Um, well, Molly brought me on board. Um, I think Molly and Carlo, you guys were working together for about a year before I came on board. Is that right? Um, and I think it was around, it was sometime in 2017, early 2017, that I think I came on board, if I recall correctly. Um, and then um, basically, you know, we, uh, yeah, it was, I'd worked with Molly before. Um, I used to run a, a film fund called Game Changer Films that um, Molly worked with me at, and um, you know we had a great time working together. So she was looking for a producing partner on this who had sort of more experience with the financing side of things. Um, but yeah, we came on board. I came on board, and um, you know got along. Actually, I'd met Carlo in two thousand nine at Sundance when oh, yeah, right. Right. Point was there and um, I had a film, my very first uh, feature as a lead producer called Children of Invention was there. So um, I don't, I, I think I might've seen Knife Point at Sundance actually. Really? And I was very impressed by it, yeah. Um, and I didn't go to NYU like Molly and Carlo did, but I, I learned producing by producing NYU thesis films because um, was, this is sort of before there was a producing program. Um, so I produced a couple of Carlo's classmates thesis films, I think. Um, so it was nice to come full circle, you know, sort of 10 years later um, and actually produce Carlo's first feature. I, I remember that conversation well that uh, Molly was referencing. I, I remember I turned to um, my colleague Dagny Luper and I said, who are the best producers in the business? And she said, Molly Asher and Minette Louie, but you'll never get them. And I went out and watched all of their incredible films, and I was just so moved and, and, and fascinated by the psychological intricacy and the passion behind um, those, those creations that I just desperately wanted to work with them. And I, but I thought, oh, it, they'll, you know, it'll never happen. But amazingly, I was so blessed and honored that they decided to, make, to tell the story with me. And it's just been the most incredible collaboration ever. And I, I'm so incredibly thankful that we all um, made this movie together. You talk a little bit about sort of going out to investors. This is, you know, a, a pretty unusual story. Um, talk about, like, did you target specific people? Do you have pe um, investors you always go to, your go-to sort of um, group? Um, and, yeah, and then the actual pitch to them. And was it always the same, or has it, has it evolved over time? Molly, you want to start? Because you were, Molly was pitching it for a while. Yeah. Before I came on board, I'm trying to remember like who we went out to at the very beginning. I think it was it wasn't necessarily individual private equity investors, but more companies that I thought might be um, a good fit. And, and this is you um, and right now together. What did you say? You, this is you and Carlo going out pitching. It right. right yes. Um, and we had a lookbook by then, right? That lookbook has evolved over time right. um, and has become much, it became much more um, thorough and, and um, but uh, so I can't remember who I went out to and we had UTA, Carlo was part of, is, is, um, is repped at UTA. So, so there was sort of the uh, project was brought out to, to people through UTA as well. Um, and then, and then I guess, uh, I think the turning point really, and correct me if I'm mis like not remembering something, but I feel like the turning point for us in uh, raising funds was when we took part in the Sundance Catalyst program um, and, uh, and, and really got a lot of momentum behind us and um, some, some interested investors from there who eventually then um, were investing in the film as well. Well, the Catalyst program is for people who don't know. Is you want to talk about it? It's sort of an intensive week of meet of pairing producers and projects up with potential investors, right? Yes, there there um, there are six narrative projects and six documentaries that are um, that are selected to then present up on a stage, like a, like a twenty minute presentation to an auditorium full of um, full of investors, and then you spend a couple days. Um, doing one-on-ones and just getting to know the investors in really kind of sometimes in a, in a more informal way. So. Remember which year this was? Which it was, just, it was like September 2017, okay. I think. Catalyst. Um, well, for me, I, this was the hardest movie I've ever had to find financing for, or just the hardest financing process I've ever encountered. You know, I think if I recall, 
um, before I came on board, Molly did um, successfully get um, people like com companies, smaller, smaller production companies with financing to be interested, um, mostly like genre leaning companies. So mm -hmm. you know, offering really small amounts, like certainly not enough to cover what we thought the budget needed to be. Um, maybe like probably the biggest offer we got was worth like half the budget or something. So, you know, there were attempts made to try to really bring the budget down, but it just didn't really work. Um, and so then we sort of, you know, opened up the pool to individual investors, which again, kicked off with Catalyst, because uh, Catalyst is primarily like high net worth individuals um, who participate. And so we did, there was some, some momentum there. We actually found three investors out of Catalyst. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we only ended up keeping one of them <laughs> because they were all minority investors and we we're still looking for the majority investor. And um, it's, it's always hard when you, you find the minority investors first because you can't really make a deal with them until the majority investor comes on board because the majority investor always dictates the terms. And so when we finally found a majority investor that looked like it was going to work, the terms weren't that great for the minority investor. So two of them dropped out. We only, we only kept one investor from Catalyst, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, all in all, during our entire, you know, two-year fundraising process, we, we, ra we raised over five times. We got over five times the budget in terms of commitments. Like, people, nobody would commit the full budget. So we kept getting commitments for pieces of the budget. Right. And so at one point, I added up all the pieces of commitment we got and they added up to more than five times our budget. And it was, drove us mad because none of the, no, no pieces fit together to really make up the full budget, you know, and, and it was frustrating. And, and this was, it was like an emotional roller coaster of like was one thinking, minute having it and then. Yeah. And I think the difficulty came from Carlo being a first time feature director, the film being a tweener, you know, it's not, it's, it's like, it's a genre film, but it's also an art house film. And those are really hard to finance because you have your art house financiers and then you have your, your separate genre financiers and like, you know, there it's either too genre or it's either too art house for one or the other, you know? So we ended up, we, we ended up doing this deal or, or carving this structure that we thought was going to work up until the 11th hour. We, we just, the, the, the um, majority financier dropped out and uh, made us really, really angry. Um, and then it wasn't until um, CAA came on board. Um, so, so basically, after we attached Haley um, Bennett, she brought on Joe Wright, to the director to executive produce our film. He's repped at CAA, so he was able to help talk CAA's um, financing, packaging department, put some pressure on them to really help us find the financing, because it was like getting to the point where we we're about to lose our window to shoot with Haley. Um, and so CAA was able to find new financiers literally at the 11th hour, like four weeks before we started shooting. Um, and it sort of, it saved our production. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. but attaching Haley gave you a, a window of her availability and therefore a start date, right? Um, yeah. It makes, makes it easier, it gives, it gives the project a, some urgency. Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah. Can you, can you tell us what the budget is? What, what's your sort of public figure that you, you say it is? It, it was between one and two million. Okay. Um, how did you come to that figure? You, you could make a very stripped down version of this film, right? For, you know, half a million. Well, we tried actually to, <laughs> to do that when we were, you know, when, when, when we lost the majority financier, we really tried, but, you know, it might be deceiving because a lot of it takes place in one, in one house. Um, we spent two weeks in one house and two weeks actually in the city going to several locations. But because of the wealthy world that it exists in, um, that, that really dictated a lot of, of like, there, there was only so, so low we could go. Um, and, and also, the the main house needed to be it couldn't be somewhere in the city it needed to be somewhere upstate with the kind of look of that so we had to um have an out of town shoot for two two weeks as well which which is always going to add to the budget meaning you're having to house your crew right yeah. feed them yeah. Of, feed them yeah all, all the time yeah um mm -hmm. what, what was and what was your reason for for doing that, Carla, what, why, why set this in the Hudson Valley and not just 
you know, in Brooklyn. <laughs> Well, you know, I've always been fascinated by uh, location as character. And, you know, very early on, we talked about the idea of the house itself being a character in the film. You know, I was very tantalized by the idea of having that ultra modern, all glass, you know, exterior. Um, so that the house itself would feel like a display case where Hunter's kind of trapped, you know. Um, and that, uh, you know, she's kind of uh, locked in to this gilded cage by these you know, invisible barriers. Um, so early on, I was enamored with that idea. Um, and, um, and so that was something that was always part and parcel of the film. I love the idea of, and we all, you know, were passionate about this, the idea of reflecting the character's internal psychological state through the sets, the production design, the cinematography, the locations, all of that. Um, so uh, that was sort of always a part of the, uh, of, the, of the journey. And, you know, to make the space feel very contained and, and kind of uh, isolated was important too. How easy was it to find that house and convince the owners to let, let a film crew in for two weeks? You take this one, Molly. <laughs> well, it was tough to find the house. We spent a lot of time um, going upstate and knocking on, on strangers' doors. <laughs> <laughs> um, both cold calling. what literally just cold calling well yeah i mean we like we we did we just went up states we f picked out different areas and um and and would just like especially for the irwin house we we did a lot of knocking on on random people's doors um that's how location scouts work they go they hone in a neighborhood and they drive around and whatever visually looks great yeah. just knock on the door yeah, and maybe you put a little, um, if they're not there, you put a little note under the door with your phone number and, and which, you know, that you're interested in the house. Um, and we were having a, we, it's, it, we were getting nervous that, that we weren't going to find it. And so we simultaneously, simultaneously then hired, um, with some grant money that we had, hired a scout to go out for a week. And, um, and you could go, just go to different areas than we'd gone to as we continued to look for the house. And at one point, um, Haley and Joe were also scouting for us and found a, a really great um, house that ultimately had just a very, a very different feel to, to it. That was a lot colder, right, Carlo? Yeah. Yeah, a lot more metal, a lot more uh, industrial uh, feeling. Um, yeah. But then, and then we, then, um, and we were going to we were going to move forward with that one, but then um, our scout showed us this house, and um, he had used it for a commercial, um, and the house had actually never been used for a feature. And um, you know, once we settled on the amount that we were going to pay, um, it, you know, it was it wasn't that difficult with him until <laughs> he was you a little bit of a crazy person. Forgot. So. <laughs> It, what you, you, I think you, you, you <laughs> blocked the trauma out of your mind. We lost the original location that we locked because the um, very, like we were very close to shooting. I think this is like three weeks out or something. And we lost it because the owner got cold feet. She just, you know, she was getting scared about the number of people who were gonna be inside her house. So then we were scrambling to find this new place. Um, and it's actually the, the place we actually shot in. It's beautiful. It's a mid-century modern looking house on the Hudson River. And um, it's an Airbnb normally, like um, the owner lives in the city, but he rents it out as an Airbnb. And yeah, but he'd never ho hosted a feature shoot before. And we were the first. What, what, are, what are the sort of, what is that conversation like? like making you know keeping him calm and, and convincing him that you know it, it's the right you know it's okay to to let a film crew in what was the sort of the things he's asking you he seemed great at first because he uh had per commercial shoot there before okay. they were probably um, like the same size as our as our indie crew yeah. um, it wasn't until later that uh <laughs> he he started like nitpicking at all the little damages that he claimed we that were actually not even true. Yeah. <laughs> Our insurance people said to us that we should next time we we're getting a, a settling on a location we should have the the location owner take some sort of like I don't think we should say this. <laughs> <laughs> He's a very yeah. litigious guy. So. Sidebar that catches wind uh, of this. Yeah. So um, when is when uh, when did you actually shoot your shoot dates? 
May 2018, right? I think it was. Yeah. Well, how many days? About 20. Yeah. Four weeks. Mm -hmm. So you said a lot of um, the money, your majority investor came in very last minute here, right? Yeah. Four weeks uh, before we started. Well, how many investors did you have total? We had three investors and three lenders, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. So can you tell us the range of those investments? Um, 25,000 was the smallest and 400,000 was the biggest. Okay. So when you were talking about a lot of sort of small investors, you were talking about people at 25 or below, 25,000 or below. But yeah. yeah, minority, right. So for so first time filmmakers listening in and producers, can you explain a little bit why it makes more sense to go with like a majority investor willing to put up a, a big chunk rather than a lot of $10,000 investors or $15,000 investors? The first reason is it's a pain in the ass to deal with multiple investors. <laughs> um, and the second is that until you have, like, like I said earlier, until you have the majority investor who dictates the terms, it's really hard to, um, they really dictate the, the terms and then the smaller investors uh, sort of have to go with those terms. Um, unless you have a bunch of small, you know, if you had like a bunch of different, you know, 25 and 100s, you probably can dictate the terms. And, and, um, but, but yeah, I, I was just going to, like that, and it's, they yeah, kind of, I was just going to say that, actually, that I, the current film and post that we have is it was a bunch of smaller investors. And I think in a lot of ways, you know, you, you, you are controlling the terms, you, you, you definitely have the creative, like, and um, you don't, you have to, there's less that you can, you, know, you might have to give up. And when you say terms, you're, are you talking about terms of the investment deal itself or terms of like content of the film, like artistic decisions, and casting? No, for, for it, films of this size, we retain as much creative control as possible. And most invest, well, some investors understand that. Some investors who were interested didn't understand that. So we didn't want to work with them. Um, but we're talking about business terms mainly. Okay. And this, but... Ultimately, I, we don't have to go into real de detail here, but these are, you know, you set up an LLC and they're investing in that. And it's a pretty a standard investment for a, a, an equity investor where they, they get their money back plus a percentage and then you divide up the profits down the line, right? Between yep. filmmakers and investors. That's right. So people understand how those are structured. Um, you also mentioned three lenders. Can you talk a little bit about that as much as you can? Yeah, so we were we were taking advantage of the New York tax credit, and um, and so we had three investors that I mean, well, lenders that were putting money in specifically to that. And so when the when the tax credit comes back, it'll go it'll go to 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 reimburse them. Okay, and they probably get a little bonus on top of that, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so they just sort of bridging the gap between. So you can get into production before that you get your tax credit money back from the state. Mm -hmm. How long does that take normally to get uh, that? It can take long in here. We still haven't got it back. We shot in 2018 and uh, <laughs> it still hasn't come it back. It can take like three years or so. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it'll be taking longer now with COVID. But, but so, so those lenders have to know that, that they'd have to, they're going to have to wait for that yeah. if they're willing to. Because usually when you claim a ta in New York anyway, when you claim a tax credit, we have to wait till the film is delivered because um, all those costs up through delivery count toward the tax credit. And so we finished our movie right before Tribeca in 2019. Um, and then actually we've been continuing to kind of tweak the movie after that. So um, we have to wait till we're done, done, then file for the credit. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about um, the production Carlo and your shoot. What, for, uh, what did you shoot on? Um, uh, Kate Arzmendi, our amazing cinematographer, shot on the Ari uh, Alexa uh, okay. with Master Prime lenses, um, which was an amazing innovation by her because I, you know, didn't know this, but Master Prime lenses can capture the texture of the world in such uh, incredible detail, and a lot of people who. Um, have Pika talk about, you know, its relation to the texture of things. 
Um, so, uh, so yeah, and, and I, I just think, you know, Kate did an absolutely incredible, uh, incredible work on the film visually. I think it's, uh, it's really stunning and she's so great at elevating the psychological intricacies and the subtext through uh, the camera direction. We worked very closely on developing a um, kind of a rigid um, vernacular of camera direction, like a strict set of rules that then Kate would break at key emotional junctures in order to underline Hunter's um, journey. So you'll notice in the beginning that a lot of um, Kate's shots are very kind of locked down master shots where Hunter's sort of lost in the frame or dominated by the space. And then all of a sudden, Kate will use like, uh, you know, a bold close up shallow depth of field or handheld, um, which really introduced an amazing kind of shift in the, uh, in the, in the course of the, of the film. Um, and, uh, and also just, to, you know, to comment on everything we were talking about before, um, you know, uh, Minette and Molly really fought with an incredible, uh, incredible conviction to get this movie made. And it was unlikely because uh, of being first time director in an unusual film. And the fact that it exists is really all owed to them and the in unstoppable, um, uh, devotion and passion and conviction that they had for the project, I think, brought it into uh, being against against the odds. Um, so, um, if, if all the directors watching can take a cue from Carlo, Carlos' gratitude to his producers, that would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it was really great, we, working on Carlos. <laughs> uh, we did, and we did like form in our pitch a sort of a, um, a real collaboration and so it was really wonderful when we got a chance to have Carlo talk to the investors like once they were interested in it and they read it then we would have Carlo talk about it and they would get even more excited about it the way that he the, the way that he just described how he wanted to do it when he talked about what the you know his how he was inspired by his grandmother adding that that's that was a crucial part I think to to getting investors. I bet. Um, did you rehearse this at all? Do you have any rehearsal period? In Catalyst, we start. We did. We were. We rehearsed quite a bit, right? Um, I mean, well, I was still like, like days later after we'd already done it. I was still in the shower saying the whole thing in my head, <laughs> <laughs> just going over it, trying to fall asleep, saying in my head. <laughs> get it I, I, out. You have to do a whole pitch, you know, in front of a whole room. And how much time did we have? Ten minutes, something like that. I thought it was twenty. Twenty minutes. Yeah. Yeah, with presentations and microphones, and you've really right. got to like, you know tell the story. So we, we did a lot of discussion and rehearsal, right? That, I actually meant rehearsal with your actors, with Haley. For oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but right. It's good to know that you do rehearse your pitches as well. <laughs> it's, people should know that a pitch should be rehearsed. It's like <laughs> a presentation. You're not going to just wing it, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Well, we, um, so first of all, I mean, we were so incredibly you know, fortunate that Haley Bennett decided to bring Hunter to life because I, she just delivers a tour de force performance in the film. I mean, she poured every iota of her soul into this uh, this character in the film. Um, and because she was so um, devoted to the project, um, we were able to meet a lot before we ever got to set or on rehearsal. Um, and she was very generous with her with her time. And that really allowed um, her and I to go over the nuances of the character and all the details of the character's arc um, before we ever got to set and to a rehearsal. So there's, you don't have much, you know, you only have a certain set of time, you know, to rehearse. So this um, being able to meet and discuss beforehand allowed us a lot of, um, even though we weren't rehearsing during that time, we were, we were talking philosophically about the story and the character. Um, and by the, so by the time we got on set, um, you know, it, we, we were all on the same uh, page about what we wanted to say. Um, now, you mentioned earlier, and it's, it's true, that the house is a big part of this film. It is a character. You have the house for two weeks. Did you, um, how did you kind of block and figure out your shots there when you only have a house for a limited time? You, a, lot, a few of those days, the first few days, you're like, so, crack, you know, figuring out your shots? Do you have access to the house before those two weeks? Like, how does that work? Yeah, Molly and Minette made certain that Kate and I would have, uh, a, I think it was a whole day to go through the house and block uh, everything. And we um, did a ton of storyboards because uh, you folks also made sure that we had a, a good chunk of time for, 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 for pre-production with me and Kate. And then we storyboarded everything. 
So, and then on the set, Kate also took photographs with stand-ins for almost every scene. So we were very prepared before we uh, arrived on set. Um, and I think that's really important. I love storyboarding. And, and even if you want to, you know, change things in the moment, you still have the discussions and the plans and the diagrams that you've already, um, already gone through. Yeah. Um, is it, before we move on to sort of the next stage of the movie, is there anything else, um, Molly or uh, Manette, you want to talk about uh, with respect to the production itself? Any, any lessons learned that uh, first time producers might find useful? Well, we had a really great crew and I think that that is so important. Um, just in, in more ways than one, you know, that crew that really, really cared about the project and cared about the story that we were telling. And um, I think it's especially important when you're doing these, these indie films that, 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 that there's more to it than just a day's work. And so, um, and a lot of that comes from having department heads that are admired by their crew and that carefully pick their crew. Yeah, and it was also, you know, something to be beware of, um, especially with first time directors is that, um, you know, there a lot of crew are frustrated filmmakers. And so you have to sort of, a lot of them express a lot of jealousy when some first time director gets his or her chance and so you just have to sort of watch for that. And our crew, we, there wasn't, there's barely any of that that I noticed on our set. Yeah. There was a lot of respect for Carlo and us. And, um, and I think that was, yeah, that was great, but it doesn't, we were lucky, you know? So you shot in, you said May, 2018, right? Um, where was your uh, ultimate goal to sort of release the film? Did you want to keep it local and you, you ultimately, you, debuted at Tribeca the following year, right? Yeah, we didn't get into Sundance. We'll tell, I'll tell you that. And we were, I was, we were shocked <laughs> because- That's what I was alluding to. Like, yeah, were you... I mean, I, I'm happy to admit it because uh, we, you know, not, not only were a Catalyst project, but um, Carlo had been in the lab, the, the screenwriter's lab with another project before. And, you know, we, so it was, but, but we're also- We're all alumni. Yeah, we're all alumni, but that's not really, I mean, the thing is, we, the film was great. We, we, we really felt the film deserved to get in on its own merits. Forget our Sundance past, you know? But um, uh, we didn't, and it was really surprising. Um, we heard, we, we, we missed it by the skin of our teeth. Like basically, mm -hmm. we, we heard that it was, th there was three films vying for two slots in the next section, um, and we were the odd person out. So the odd film out. So we ended up um, getting into Rotterdam, South By, and Tribeca. And so we had to figure out which of those three we wanted to premiere in. Um, and it was a really hard decision. I mean, they all have merits. And yeah, we, very debated, hard. Yeah, we you, debated it in a very heated way with everyone involved. Um, <laughs> which and they, all, they all wanted, um, well, firstly, I think Sundance programmers would, would be kind of pleased to hear what you're saying because they're always told by people who don't get in, it's like, yeah, but you you just program all the alumni movies and like if you go through the labs you get in it's not a shoe in right well i think we were a little bit of a sacrificial lamb in that sense because sometimes they want to prove that they don't just take alumni projects so that's fine but, Point um, proven. <laughs> with, with, with respect to rotterdam south by and uh, tribeca you couldn't do rotterdam and tribeca both right they both wanted world premieres I think we could have, and we talked about that too, but because Rotterdam is a great fest, I love Rotterdam, but it's not really a market. Um, and so the, we wanted the first, our world premiere to be at a market, to be at a place where the film could sell. Um, sure. So that was the issue with Rotterdam. And, and it's a, like I said, it's between a, a genre and an art house film. And if we programmed it at Rotterdam, it would definitely be cast much more in an art house light um, which is not the best for commercial prospects. So uh, in preparation for um, Tribeca, did you put a team together? Do you have a, a sales rep, a producer's rep, or a publicist? Yep. Well, our, um, one of our financiers is also a sales agent, uh, Charades, and so um, our foreign sales agent. So they were on from, from the beginning. And then uh, Carlo is repped at UTA. And so um, 
and uh, and because CAA had also helped us with financing, they co-repped domestic, and we and we brought them on during the uh, while we were submitting. No, actually, they were they were on probably before that, but but they were on when we were submitting film to film festivals. We didn't wait until we got into a festival to bring on the domestic. Yeah, I mean, UTA and CAA were on from the very beginning, way way before. So yeah, mm -hmm. right. You said through, through Joe Wright, CAA was was. Joe Wright, yeah. UTA was on first because of Carlo. UTA was on even before I was, I think. And then um, CAA came on board because of Joe to really help right. for the money. Um, and then Charades came on board as a financier and they ended up selling foreign. And they actually pre-sold some territories even before the film was finished. They sold Russia and Japan just based on the concept. Um, and, and then were successful in selling other territories after we made uh, our U.S. sale at Tribeca. Where, where is charades based? Paris. Okay. They're French, yeah. Um, and, um, and then we brought on, we hired um, publicists, of course, for the festival, PMK, BNC. Um, they're, they're New York based, they were great. Um, and they ended up being the publicist for our domestic release through IFC Films as well. I now have to ask this, don't have to answer it, but I, I know people listening would want to know, like, how much should you pay, um, how much the reasonable, you know, publicist fee to expect to, to be to pay at a fest for a festival run and the sales sales agents what what is their sort of standard percentage usually for a u.s domestic mm -hmm. the going standard i think for net for public for fest publicist for a major festival like tribeca or sundance is about ten thousand dollars um give or take and then domestic sales agents typically charge five to ten percent um and then foreign sales agent charge a range, it's a range actually between, I would say 20 and 35, 20 to 30 around. Right. Yeah, yeah I've heard stories of people, of publicists charging 25,000. Yeah, I've, I've told. The for a festival? Is, for it? Yeah, for a festival run. Not a, not a major festival run either. Like you, you were overcharged. Wow. wow. Um, <laughs> and then I think people should know that uh, the kind of the easier sell should, you can negotiate down a, a lower percentage rate, right? If you've got a slam dunk, very commercial firm with movie stars in it that could sell for a lot of money, you can negotiate a lower percentage there for your sales agent, right? Because it's such an easy sale. You could, versus, yeah. Which is something that's tougher. They, they will have to work harder to get. That's where you're going to go up to the 10% and maybe 12%. That's the tricky thing is you don't want to undercut them necessarily. Always, you know, it's like, okay, 5% sounds better for us, but it's like, are they then incentivized to go out and really sell the movie? There's, there's a balance there. Yeah. And something I think that um, I've known of some young film filmmakers to make the mistake of is, is paying sales agents up front. And, and if your sales agent is asking to do that, then I would say I would, say you wouldn't want to work with them because it's not standard to pay them up front you pay them they, yeah. they get their percentage when they sell the film the other thing too i would say is for newbie filmmakers is that oftentimes if your film does not sell within the first 30 days out of a festival the sales agent completely checks out <laughs> and then you're left with this film that as a producer that you then have to go try and sell yourself you know um or just pick up the slack so um just know that going in because there's always you know a new festival in the horizon new films in the horizon and then our attention shifts to the new films um so that's just something to be aware of i think even more so now in the covid era or the post-covid era all these financing sales agents are well the agencies in general are like in trouble um but i think the financing sales departments are especially sort of vulnerable right now can you talk a little bit about your preparation for tribeca and your strategy in terms of positioning the film and whether you want to kind of hype it a little or like keep it below you know not over hyped so that uh people discover it and did you do it was there any press like carlo did you do any sort of interviews pre tribeca as a way of positioning the film um well I'll, I'll let M Molly and Manette, um comment on most of that, um, and then I'll follow up on the about the press. No, you should. You did all the press, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, we did lots of press. Um, you know, we there was a an early um, uh, TV 
thing that we did that was like a promotion for Tribeca that we were all a part of. That was wonderful kind of way to start it off. And, uh, um, and um, there was a whole day of um, press and interviews and discussion uh, with um, Haley and I and Austin and we kind of all, um, and Molly and, and we all, Mineta, I think as well too, and we all sort of maneuvered around and handled the press. And that was my first time doing that kind of press. Now I feel much more schooled in it because, um, you know, we toured around the whole world with the film and uh, went to many festivals. And so now I'm like, oh yeah, okay, press day, sure. And in, <laughs> in Paris, we had two full days of press packed from morning until night um, in, in this one hotel room. <laughs> and by the end of it, I was, you could see on some of the videos, I was sort of, you know, tired. Um, but it, I, but I really have grown to love talking to the press and love doing interviews and getting into the discussion because you're talking with people who love movies. So it's like a natural kind of, uh, um, connection and a wonderful experience. And I think our movie lends itself to interesting discussions. There's a lot of interesting questions and journalists that have taken their own sort of tact in the film or brought it into their way of thinking about things or analyze it in different perspectives. So yeah, the press, the press experience has been wonderful. Um, from, from, from yeah, I remember how nervous you were at that very first interview. And yeah. um, it was really cute. It was, it was actually really nice seeing the whole process through a first time filmmaker's eyes. Um, because, you know, I'm so jaded. <laughs> um, but it was really nice to, to see Carlo evolve, you know, and now he's a pro. <laughs> well, that first day I was like, oh my God, what am I doing? But you two were so amazing. You just knocked it out of the park that I was like, okay, okay, this is how it's done. Let me just learn and study and, you know, I'll get there someday. Um, can you, t yeah, Molly and Minette talk a little bit about that sort of positioning the film and hype versus, uh, you know, restraint with PMK or publicists? I think in this day and age, lean on the hype <laughs> because there's just so much noise out there, not just with other films and like just so much stuff, you know? So you get barraged with everything new, social media. So whatever you can latch on to, to have people pay attention to your movie, just do it. Um, there's no- After you've wrapped. No restraint. <laughs> Not before you've wrapped, after you've wrapped, then, then let the world know. <laughs> Is there a reason for that? Just focus on getting in in the can? That's it. No, no, it's, <laughs> we just, we're very- You just um, don't want to be bothered. About, yeah, um, you know, we wouldn't want like any press coming around and so that like the actors can focus. Oh, uh, okay. Right, but it, right. it, people get distracted, casting crew get distracted if there's like, an announcement or whatever. Yeah, we like to keep it tight. So can you talk about the sale a little bit? Um, IFC ultimately purchased the film. Uh, can you explain why you went with them? Um, well, I think, you know, we, I think just as much as we ran into challenges in financing because it's a, a tweener, you know, a, a film that is a mix of genres, I think that that also became a challenge in, in finding a distributor that we had a number of distributors who loved the film, but weren't quite sure um, where to place it, how to market it. And we and IFC seemed to really, really get it. And I think it shows in the way that they put the press, the marketing together, uh, really nuanced and really got it. Um, so that I think is, is, and also, you know, IFC is I think a, 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 a company that we, we love the films that they make and, um, so yeah. it felt like a good fit for, for us. We had several offers actually, um, and most of them were from more genre focused labels and channels and streamers and whatnot. Um, so we, you know, we didn't want to take one of those because we didn't want to purely cast it in a horror light. Um, and so yeah, IFC was the the was the distributor who allowed us to let it be what it was, which was part our house and part genre. Um, and they've done a fantastic job with marketing the movie. Um, we couldn't be happier with them. Um, what, and can you tell us what they, the terms of the deal, what, what they purchased? Is it all US rights? Just what? US rights, yeah. Just US rights, because Charade had all the other rights. Um, and, and, they, and so it was a theatrical uh, day and date. So, um, with a, you know, we, we released on March 6th, which was the last normal weekend before the lockdown. And so 
we released in three theaters in New York and LA. And then the following week, we were going to open in, you know, 35 more theaters. Um, and then we did open in some of them, but then we had to shut down pretty quickly after that. So it would have expanded. It was actually doing decently and it would have expanded, but um, yeah. So you expanded because, yeah, I think LA was very quick to lock down, but other parts of the country, the movie theaters were still open. So you opened a few more there. We opened a few more there, but by by the you know the end of the second week of our release, it was just everybody was shut down basically. But then there's a little twist here because right they they did exploit it further. Did you, you play any other? You played drive-ins. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. we did. We were one of the first features to play a drive-in, and we were the very first number one film at the box office since the pandemic started. So. so Talk a little bit about this decision and, and how that came about. And yeah, I'm, I'm curious. I don't know. Go to, I think it was IFC that was there. You know, we had never discussed going doing drive-ins. I think they just tried it and and um, before even telling us. Well, they yeah. told us like right before we released there, and we we're like, great. Um, and so I think it was almost an experimental thing for them. Um, and they've since done really well with it. I mean, they released. The wretched after us, and they, they earned high seven, six figures at the box office uh, just from drive-ins, which is pretty incredible. Which is decent numbers, just by you know, even by art regular art house theater standards, it's good. So um, it's been very impressive. And since then, uh, the film's played a lot of festivals, right? A lot more festivals around the world. Well, last year, thank goodness we finished our festival run last year. <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean, that's true. Um, Carlo, did you travel with the film at all? I did. Um, went all over the world. It was such an incredible experience. And uh, we won 23, 20, 23 festival awards, um, yeah. a lot of them for best uh, uh, actor. Uh, and uh, it was uh, an incredible experience. And what I didn't realize on the beginning of the journey, I mean, Tribeca was wonderful. And then it was like, that was it. We went, I started just traveling around the uh, around the world. Um, and I didn't really understand that if you have the word fantastic in front of a festival, that it means that it's a genre based festival. I was just like, why are these festivals think they're fantastic, <laughs> you know? And, but then, I, but then going around and going to all of those amazing festivals, was such a great experience because you're in this world of people who are like obsessed with genre films and really want to talk about it and are excited. And what's interesting is that our film was able to go to those festivals, but then also go to the festivals that are dealing more with like, um, drama films um, and prestige films like uh, Deville, where uh, Catherine Deneuve uh, gave the, uh, uh, the the film an award, which was so incredible because, um, you know, uh, she's such an amazing artist and Haley was very inspired by her for, you know, her, for her performance. So, um, yeah, we went, uh, went all over the world um, and it was, uh, and it was incredible. And, and it was incredible too to see different audiences kind of really reacting and taking the film into their own personal cosmologies and people coming up to me after and wanting, I'm sometimes in tears and wanting to talk about the film and, you know, um, discuss it. And, um, and that was incredible. And initially when the film, when we launched in the States, you know, and everything went down, it was like, it was this real sort of, um, you know, moment of adjustment. But because IFC, who've been incredible, um, I guess they had originally, right, planned to do a day and date release even before, um, it was already online and, and amazingly a lot of, you know, the sort of fan base has developed around the film online. There's been a lot of wonderful responses and fan art and reviews that said that the film is sort of striking a nerve with people. I think Rolling Stone said it was like the perfect film for our helpless moment, this idea of, you know, uh, it's filmed out somebody who's isolated. So I think a lot of people felt the connection there. So, um, so that was great to see a lot of people embracing and watching it on, um, online. The festival run was the decisions as, as to which festivals you played around the world, was that, was that uh, the three of you that did that? Or was that in now the hands of charades or IFC? Who, who's, who's taking charge of that? Uh, charades was mainly driving the, for, the international festivals. Um, you know, they took festival rights. So um, thank goodness, because it's a lot of work. <laughs> so right. they handled all the submissions. If there was a festival we were interested in playing that we'd played with before or whatever, we would mention, hey, did you submit to this festival? Or, you know, I'd love for you to submit to this festival. Same with IFC. Um, well, by the time they came on board, we'd already like um, 
agree to some certain domestic festivals, but after they came on board, we um, consulted with them on the various festivals and it was the same thing. I mean, I've seen handle all the festivals, but we would give them suggestions about where we thought the film should play. And do they charge um, screening fees? Do you know? I think they do, yeah, both charades and IFC. Yeah, I, I know that some filmmakers don't know that you can ask if, you know, for a screening fee and, and there's not a huge amount, but it can add up. No, it, but even if, you know, the when I was doing the festival stuff before my films would sell or um, I would charge 500 to 1,000 per screening. Um, so, yeah. Right. Um, and then foreign sales, you, you did mention that uh, Charade sold a few territories before, um, what, you know, why, before you'd even finished. Um, but how many have you sold now? Ah, quite a mm. few. Um, a we, yeah, actually, I should pull up this spreadsheet. But um, well, we did theatrical in France, even in January, even before okay. the, the US one. That was pretty successful theatrical run in France. We've sold the UK, we've sold um, South Korea, Taiwan, um, where else? Singapore, we, we're about to release, uh, Canada, Spain, Mexico, uh, Australia, New Zealand, <laughs> uh, Hungary, right? Did I miss any? I'm looking now, Russia, I don't know if you said that. The Japan we sold before, um, before you mm -hmm. finished the film. Are you in profit yet? Um, we have, you know what the thing is that the, since we were just released, there's usually a quite a bit of lag time, a two quarter lag time before you get your first statement. So um, we're not- That would be another one of my questions. Yeah, it'll probably be at the end of the year where we'll find out where we are numerically. But you know, we have gotten some preliminary like VOD rental numbers from IFC and they've been really good. So, um, but we haven't gotten reports from around the world yet. Um, right. Yeah. But you know, you'll, you'll get a, 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 your sales agent will sell to, as you said, Russia or Israel. It, it takes a while to see those funds finally make it back to you. It does. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is they were, usually they're not paid until, you know, very close to the release. And in some of these territories I've named, we haven't even been released yet. So um, it's going to be a while before we find out the, what the numbers are. And how many of them are still holding out for uh, theatrical and waiting for the quarantine and lockdown to end? Well, we also had a theatrical in Taiwan. Um, uh -huh. and we, we might have one in South Korea. I think South Korea is still holding out. Yeah. For one. Okay. Yeah. So that pretty much brings us up to date, uh, right? I think so. I think yeah. so. <laughs> um, the film is, is can be uh, is on VOD now, right? Yes. If you still want to see it uh, in while we're locked down, um, but I final well, question. Oh. Blu-ray uh, in August. It'll be on Blu-ray. So. Okay. Um, my final question to everyone that uh, I interview for these case studies is just words of advice for people listening to this, things that you've learned from this experience that you'd like to share with people. It can be uh, very nuts and boltsy or a bit, little bit more, more holistic. So up to you. Mm. Put me on the spot here. <laughs> well, I would just say to echo uh, what Molly was referring to before is surround yourself with incredible collaborators who want to tell the story, uh, who are passionate about the project, um, and the joy uh, and celebration of art and storytelling that will come out of that will make your movie good. And I, you know, and just looking back on it, I'm like, that what that is the key, and that was the thing that made this such a wonderful project. And you know, when you do that, I mean, it, we all this was a real labor of love for everybody, and and I I, I feel that it shows. And I mean, lastly, I guess I would say, you know, as storytellers and creators, I think. Uh, I believe in the power of storytelling, and I think movies can, you know, um, fight prejudice, increase empathy, make people feel seen, and speak truth to power, and change the um, uh, the narrative. And so, I think, uh, um, you know, it, it, telling stories is something that I think is um, is integral. And I just feel so honored and blessed that I got to make this movie with all these wonderful people. That's a very uh, common answer that we get. 
to that question from before. Uh, they either say what you said or they say don't work with jerks. Well, it's basically the same. Don't work with jerks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, minute, uh, minutes? Yeah, sure. Um, I would say, you know, this movie has had so many ups and downs, like so many roller coasters um, at every single stage. And um, I, you know, there have been so many compromises that we could have made along the way, like reducing the budget or working with the financier who wanted to put themselves in the movie or, <laughs> you know, um, which we actually went down the road with pretty far. Uh, or, you know, working with financiers who thought they were producers and wanted control and, um, you know, or like hiring a different director to direct it or so many different permutations. And in the end, we stood our ground and was like, you know, we can't, we have to make the movie we want the way we want to make it. And we're, it turned out perfectly. It turned out exactly as we had hoped. And I, you know, if you have that, you can do anything. You know, we didn't get to Sundance. That was a disappointment, but Tribeca was great. And, uh, you know, we ended up with the distribution deal we wanted. And, you know, COVID shut down our movie, but then it ended up doing great on VOD. And so, I don't know. I just, I feel like you have to keep the faith. And, and if you can't make the movie the way you want to make it, don't make it. You know, I think wait, wait, put it, you know, put it away and like pull it out again later. If we had made this movie, if we'd made compromises, in the making of this movie, it just wouldn't be the same. Molly? Um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with what both of, both of you said. Um, so I would only really add that, you know, when, when you're working on your own films or when you're a producer looking for projects, finding, finding films that, that, um, that ask questions and that, that make you curious because, because there are so many ups and downs and it's such a long time that you work on these projects, you, you want to have something that you, can't, you, can't, you can constantly be digging and finding more. And, and I think then that, that then parlays into being able to get it out there in the world and, and press wanting also to dig into it. Um, so finding films that are urgent and have something to say and have lots of questions to ask and keep you curious. Well, I want to thank the three of you for joining us. Uh, this has been terrific. Um, you know, congratulations on the film and uh, I hope you will stay well, stay healthy and sane and keep making movies and uh, hopefully we'll see your next productions in theatres when they reopen. But uh, yeah, thanks again, Carlo. Thank you for joining us, Carlo. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much for talking with us. It was a real pleasure. Molly. Thanks, Molly. Thank you. Thanks and so much. Thank you and thank you, Film Independent. Thank you.